And today we have an opportunity to speak with senior fellow and policy analyst Janusz Bugajski of the Jamestown Foundation in Washington, D.C., that published a book by Mr. Bugajski titled Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, back in January 22, just a few weeks prior to 24-2. Welcome, Mr. Bugajski. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me, Steph. Got pleasure to be here. Thank you for writing this book and to the Jamestown Foundation for making it available for free downloading on their website. RQA is currently working on a Ukrainian language translation of Failed State, a guide to Russia's rupture. When many of the processes that Mr. Bugajski describes in his book will be further along the way in a few months time, processes that uh, you have described as rupture. And perhaps that's a good place to start. The uh, choice of the word to describe the historical events we are witnessing to a corrupt and decaying empire, the word you chose to describe it is rupture. And that for me has a connotation of something sudden, like a like a pipe bursting or or some type of biological process, like an appendix bursting. And I suppose, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, that rupture might have a specific connotation in political science or is or is rupture just another way of saying uh disintegration dissolution fragmentation or or, or fracture yeah it's a good question uh i think rupture i used initially to signify that it was a major event um it, it wasn't just a little fracture it wasn't just a regime collapse it wasn't just a change of system that this was foundational in other words that the state itself faced rupture faced breakup faced some sort of dramatic not necessarily overnight far from it in fact i talk about it being a process but faced something dramatic that could not be reversed back to the way it was uh, I think that's more more of a sort of epic changing, epoch changing um, uh, uh, signal, uh, hence the word rupture. Before we get into the heart of the matter, namely the various scenarios that the rupture process can take, the forward to your book uh, talks about mass mobilization, uh, not exactly the partial mobilization that Putin announced on September 21st. And you wrote that if the Kremlin announces a mass mobilization, it would place Russia on a war footing, exacerbate fear and anger in Russian society, increase the number of war casualties and further deplete the economy. So if that is the case with mass mobilization, is it fair to say that with partial mobilization, it will only accomplish these things partially, i.e. place Russia on a war footing partially, exacerbate fear and anger in Russian society, partially increase the uh, number of casualties and further deplete the economy, but only partially. It almost seems like the uh, gremlins and their Kremlins think <laughs> that they manage their way out of this mess by letting things happen only partially. Well, first of all, let me say this, the term partial <laughs> wasn't in the document that uh, that was issued um, regarding mobilization. I think Putin was trying to still reassure the Russian public that they're not fully at war, they don't need to worry, that everything's under control, don't panic, you know, this sort of situation. But if you look at the facts, they're trying to mobilize as many people as possible. Um, they don't have the capabilities, this is the key, they don't have the capabilities the polygons, the officers, the, the weaponry, the uniforms, the logistics in order to mobilize over a million uh, over a million army, which is something that they that they've been boasting about was 1.7 million a boast that the, the Russian army, the second strongest on the earth. But when it comes to practical things, when it comes to actually uh, putting the army in the field, uh, giving them the proper weapons, uniforms, officers, etc. They don't have it. They don't have those capabilities. So I would say it's not really a partial mobilization. It is a full mobilization disguised as partial. And I think it will probably continue up to a point where either Putin is overthrown and the generals realize that this war is, is not going to be won, or there's what I think is probably more likely, there's going to be mutinies and revolts within Russia itself, not only within the military, but between different military formations, uh, 
we've already seen this between Kadarovtsi and uh, and the, uh, the the Wagnerite private army and the normal military with and the these locals in Donbas that they've recruited as cannon fodder. You know, if we see increasingly these. Um, these revolts, these mutinies, I think we're going to, I think that's going to be one major ingredient of what I write about in my book, which is the war being blown back against the state itself, against the regime, against the system that generated this war. So I don't think anything's going to be partial. It may start at a smaller scale, which I think we're witnessing, but I think it's going to accelerate. And I think, let, let me say this stuff at the, uh, the beginning. I, I finished this book three weeks before uh, the full-scale invasion or the large-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, nothing that I've written I think I would change. The only thing I think that's happened is it's accelerated. It's accelerated some of these ingredients towards dissolution, towards fracture, towards rupture, as, as, I, as I detail actually in my book. Yeah, it was interesting in the um, uh, few, first few weeks of the war to listen to analysts like um, uh, there's a fellow in, in DC by the name of Andrei Piontkowski who was saying, um, oh, there won't be mobilization, that mobilization <laughs> will be uh the end that 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 there's no it's so, such a crazy uh, uh move that there putin w would be shooting himself in the foot if not mm -hmm. in another part of his body uh if he did it and he seems to have done so well i i think uh, there was this idea amongst a lot of analysts western analysts as well as russians of course that uh, th th this was a huge invincible army that this was the second army in the world and even a small operation or a restricted operation against ukraine would be successful and they were basing this on the 2014 takeover of crimea where unfortunately the ukrainian army for many many years had been demoralized uh, decommissioned uh, downgraded uh, and wasn't really a full fighting force uh, which it then became. They underestimated what the Ukrainians managed to achieve over those seven or eight years after the takeover of Crimea and the takeover of Donbass. So there was both an overestimation of the capabilities of the Russian army and an underestimation of this modern force that was being created in Ukraine uh, that was becoming increasingly uh, experienced in battle uh, determined to regain territory and not willing to allow the capital to fall. And that was, I think, key. I think the defense of Kiev, I think, will go down in history as one of the most memorable um, battles in Europe, quite frankly. And since then, of course, we've had other successes from the Ukrainian forces. They've learned in the field. If they had the weapons earlier from NATO, I think this would have probably been over even sooner. Um, but that's another story that, that we can go into. But going back to your point, I think there was an overestimation. Uh, it's almost like the Russians believe their own propaganda. Uh, they didn't, um, and even some of our military analysts didn't really understand the basis of Russian society. Because remember, an army mirrors society. Corruption, theft, lies, deception. I mean, the entire military structure is riddled with this. Even now, some of these Russian bloggers are finally talking about it, that our military was actually pretty crappy, and the Ukrainians have proved it. So, uh, yeah, I would say, unfortunate, um, a lot of military analysts are going to, going to have to go back to the drawing board in analyzing the Russian army, not simply looking at battle orders or equipment that they claim to have or the number of troops and so on, but to look at the facts of what's going on in the ground with, with capabilities, with officer, uh, um, uh, 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 officer relations with soldiers, uh, ethnic relations in the militaries, um, there's so many things that haven't really been considered that Ukraine has actually exposed about Russia, uh, that this is going to be a goldmine for analysis, I think, for many years. And is, um, uh, we're talking about Russia, of course, but I'll, I'll just, because we're, uh, this will be translated for Ukrainian, into Ukrainian, I might ask, um, the, is there any soul searching happening in terms of the underestimation of of the um, of what Ukraine was capable of. I mean, in, in your book, you mentioned that there was, uh, you know, the anti-communist uh, guerrilla uh, movement in the 40s. Uh, 
uh, Ukrainians, we know, um, of course, that in, in the 1920s, after the Bolshevik Revolution and and the uh, uh, the short-lived independence, um, there was something called uh, that in, in Ukrainian is called a Narodna Vina. There was a people's war. It wasn't mm -hmm. uh, a cakewalk uh, <laughs> with the famine kind of being of 32, 33, the Holodomor being the final uh, nail in the coffin years, but it was preceded by years, uh, at least half a decade of, um, of resistance and and full out warfare. So you had the the Machnos and and mm -hmm. the and the various uh, Ottomans. And the the lesson Ukrainians seem to have taken from that period of history was that uh, you know a we need to back one leader. You can't have this internist and uh, infighting and uh, and uh, uh, Ukrainians called Ottomanshina, where there's. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, and I'm wondering if there's any soul searching or any analysis or uh, happening in Washington about what made Ukraine um, successful in in the early part. Yeah, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of soul searching, not only for military analysts, but also for those people who misunderstood Ukraine. As you said, Ukrainian history is replete with uh, rebellions against Tsarist control. Um, against uh, Bolshevik control. If you look at the the civil wars in uh, um, after World War One, I, I mean there were wars against uh, the Red Army and against the White Army. You mentioned Machno. There were you know there was a Ukrainian Republic that was established. There was uh, the autonomous movements and independence movements amongst uh, uh, Atamans and uh, Cossack formations. So there was a long period of uh, resistance, I would say, to Bolshevization. And the fact that Stalin eventually had to kill, uh, murder uh, so many peasants, which was the, the, the really the heart of Ukrainian statehood, national uh, identity, um, language, and so forth, it, it just shows that the fear that there was in Moscow about Ukrainian resistance. Because quite frankly, I think for many generations, the Russians realized that without Ukraine, uh, Russia is not really an empire. <laughs> it becomes then um, confined to a much smaller territory and has to come to terms with the fact that it doesn't control other, other major peoples. Uh, and actually, even after World War II, as you know, the resistance, particularly in Western Ukraine, uh, against Soviet control, against re-Bolshevization, re re-Sovietization of, of Ukraine was fierce and it lasted until the 50s. And we're talking about, again, an army that had beaten the Nazis, and but they couldn't beat the Ukrainian resistance. So I think there is a lot of, um, um, let's say, there's insufficient study of Ukraine at American universities amongst policymakers. Uh, I, I wrote an article a few weeks ago called the problem is not russophobia it's russophilia in other words there's an over focus on russian studies um, russian literature russian history russian interpretations rather than uh, ukrainian or belarusian or polish or other interpretations of what's been going on in this region uh, for centuries and unfortunately ukraine has got the thin end of the, the stick because uh, Russia, quite frankly, Moscovy, has appropriated much of Ukrainian history as its own, going right back to Kiev and Rus days. So there's a lot, uh, and there's so much ignorance, I would say, in Western um, uh, academic, but even more so in policy circles about Ukraine, about its history. This is something I think uh, in future that the new upcoming Ukrainian generation is going to have to help the West come to terms with, to teach the West about what is Ukraine, what is Ukrainian identity, uh, what what history are we regaining, restoring, uh, re re recapturing, if you like, from from the Russian occupant. So you know, it's a it's a it's a long process, but hopefully, a lot of Ukrainians now, uh, after this war is over and Ukraine starts to reconstruct will find good positions and will be listened to in, in universities, in policy institutes. And of course, uh, it's another whole other area, but NATO has a lot to learn also, I think, from Ukraine.
and on on the point of um thank you for that that uh, i'll go back to russia now that was about uh unexpected bonus uh, uh answer about, about ukraine um in your book um you write about um uh, russophobia and um uh there's a but there's a different uh side of russophobia there's uh um there's the traditional russophobia but there's a different kind of russophobia if we can call it that it's kind of a russophobia that's not um, acknowledged or it's um it's a russophobia that is um um based on uh, not letting russia uh uh rupture and uh or seeing uh the rupture or the the historical uh, processes that are going to happen to empire as an opportunity and mm -hmm. that by denying uh the peoples of russia uh, this opportunity to uh to um uh, live in a post colonial uh, 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 post empirical uh, construct or constructs is a uh, is kind of a latent form of russophobia itself absolutely i mean the phobia itself means fear and what you're talking about is precisely the fear uh, that somehow uh, russia's rupture that the emergence of new states of new regions um, is dangerous um i would say far from it it's it's an opportunity the the process may be messy but it's an opportunity for us as it was when the soviet empire collapsed in central eastern europe or the soviet union collapsed in the early 90s it's actually an opportunity for us to help create uh, new entities new states that emerge from russia uh, that will be cooperative that we can work with that can be integrated assimilated in both uh, atlantic institutions but also p pacific institutions remember there's a lot of territory in the far east um that is prime for uh independence as well uh and they're going to be veering towards the pacific area uh, to, towards japan towards taiwan towards uh, south korea Canada, um, United States with Alaska. So, you know, th there's there's a lot of territory around Russia, I would say, that we need to focus on um, and uh, help to manage, I would say, the process of transformation, of rupture, which will result in, in the emergence of new states. We cannot fear this process. Um, I remember when this, before the Soviet Union was breaking up, if you remember the famous Chicken Kiev speech by President Bush uh, in Kiev itself, just weeks before the majority of Ukrainians or Ukrainian citizens voted for independence. Um, luckily, they didn't listen to him. But I think it was emblematic of the sort of fears that Western politicians have regarding change. They get used to the status quo. They get used to business as usual. Um, they don't want to rock the boat because of the unpredictability. But, you know, history is full of un unpredictabilities. And sometimes in order to have long-term security, you need short-term instability. Uh, so, again, and the war should have taught people that all is not well in Russia. And, uh, you know, the, the, the future is not going to return back to the way it was in the past, but there's going to be some major, huge structural foundational changes in Russian state that we really need to start preparing for. I fear, though, Stefko, that our people, our, our policymakers, maybe in, in Poland, Baltic states, where I think they're much more aware of what's going on, maybe some preparations have been made, but we're insufficiently looking towards the future. And I think this is, this is something I've been warning about for several years now. Um, and there are other good analysts that have also been warning about this. I mean, Paul Gobo, I, I think, is an excellent example of somebody who's really been on track in terms of what is happening within Russia and how we should be preparing. So uh, I'm not the only one, but uh, unfortunately, well, for, hopefully the book will, will, will sort of penetrate some of the policy circles and make people start thinking of the unthinkable. And right. I think Ukrainian war, the war against Ukraine, uh, is contributing to this. People realize that things cannot, or beginning to realize things cannot go back to the way they were. So what is the next step?
Right. So if um, if you really love Russia, if you you know really are a Russophile, let history take its course and and help Russia along the way. That's that's how you can express your love for for Russia. Uh, let history take its course. Absolutely. Let me add to that. There's a certain amount of sort of um, um, let's say derogatory uh, attitude towards Russians, <laughs> with paradoxically stemming from this Russophilia. In other words, the idea that they're all sheep, the idea that they all blindly follow leaders, that they won't rebel, that they're incapable of creating different states. You know, this is sort of a very patronizing attitude, I think, uh, towards a lot of citizens in Russia, not just Russian ethnics, but, you know, the Tatars and Buryats and other people, North Caucasus, other people in Russia who are very much capable of creating their own states, of breaking away from Moscow, of, of finally rupturing this, this sort of imperial tissue that holds this, uh, this state together, this artificial federation together. So again, I think uh, some of the things we did in the Cold War, such as helping um, not just Democrats, but helping independence movements, helping um, regionalists, helping uh, you know ethnic revivals in Russia. These are the sort of things I think we should be focusing on now as well. Uh, I don't think uh, we should simply be focusing on Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, because that misses the point. I mean, Russia is not simply uh, <laughs> Moscow and St. Petersburg. It's a huge country with many different aspirations and potentially quite rich countries if you look at Siberia and the Far East. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're talking to Janusz Bogajski about his book, Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture. And it really does uh, read like a guidebook to the history of uh, Russian imperialism and the, and the prison of nations, to borrow uh, a Ukrainian uh, a phrase, with Moscow as its warden. It, and it's sort of a guidebook to the to the history of the last 300 years of the landmass that will become formally known as Russia. Uh, and if I were to choose one paragraph as a reader to sum it up, it'd be this one. The process of fracture could lead to a number of destabilizing scenarios, whether through spillovers of armed conflicts, refugee outflows, territorial wars, energy, transportation, and trade disruptions, or various military incursions. However, it can also result in the creation of several several viable states with a higher degree of political stability than the Russian Federation, a sufficient economic base, a favorable geographic location, and governments committed to international cooperation. I like that paragraph because it includes what seems like both the uh, best and worst case scenarios and reminds us that the uh, bark of the prospect of a Russia falling apart is, is, is worse than the actual bite that might occur in the process. Am I reading that right? Uh, yes, you are. W what I'm trying to, to outline in the scenarios I develop is that it won't be an easy and quick process. Um, I, I talk about all the variables that will feed into it, but once it starts, I would say you could have both conflict and cooperation um in the sort of post-russia the whole post-russia space in other words in some regions i think countries will emerge as they did for instance from the soviet union without much of a conflict um where you know regional governors or new leaders of ethnic groups republics say you know enough is enough we're going to separate we're going to create links with outside world you know whether it's turkey or japan or united states or european union so in in some places i think it will be a relatively um uh, peaceful process in other places i think we could have conflicts uh, either some remnants of you know the russian state will start to as milosevic did for instance in in serbia it would start um, wars against neighboring republics, against neighboring regions, reclaiming territory, uh, trying to spark ethno-Russian nationalism, uh, which ultimately will be fatal for the Federation because then you spark uh, the reverse, which is anti-ethno-Russian nationalism in various parts of the of the state. Uh, but you know, I think the process in some places will be prolonged. 
uh, and potentially quite violent. You know, I'm not excluding the possibility that the some in some places there will be violence, but I don't think this will be violence. You know, we keep hearing about loose nukes and so on. I don't think this will be that sort of violence. I think more likely it's going to be civil wars. It's going to be territorial uh, incursions. Uh, I'm talking about within Russia itself, uh, parts of Russia, territorial claims as, for instance, the Serbs had on Croatia or Bosnia or Kosovo. You know, we could witness very similar things uh, in parts of the, uh, of the Federation. But other parts, I think, will probably escape relatively unscathed. Um, for instance, I think um, those that will benefit most are those that are resource rich, um, particularly those with foreign borders or transportation routes uh, in the Far East, in uh, parts of Siberia, uh, maybe even in the Far North. You know, the Komi Republic and Kantimansi in Western Siberia, they're quite well off um, regions with resources. I think the biggest struggle is going to be, quite frankly, in Central Russia. Uh, what sort of a state is going to emerge from inner Russia, from European Russia? And, you know, we have voices talking about the separation, uh, a new Novgorod Republic, uh, maybe some Cossack republics. Remember, there are, uh, there are real Cossacks who don't necessarily support the Russian state who may want their independence. Uh, as, you know, we mentioned earlier, Cossack formations after, uh, during Russia's civil war after World War I. So, you know, it's, and I go through a lot of these um, historical precedents in, in many of these regions and republics. In some cases, some of these ethnic groups can, can you know, they, they can look back to a pre-Russian future before colonialism, you know, before Muscovy uh, gained these territories and colonized these territories. In other cases, even the settlers, you know, some of these Russians and Ukrainians, remember, a lot of Ukrainians settled in Siberia, southern Siberia, eastern Pacific region. Um, they're not necessarily tied to Moscow. Uh, far from it, I would say that there is this sort of independence streak amongst these people who are descendant from families that were deported by the Tsar. Um, so much less, I think, uh, uh, linked or, or let's say, um, under the thumb of Moscow and may welcome that opportunity in future to declare their sovereignty and independence. And if you look at after, uh, last point, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russian Federation then was also, remember, on the verge of collapsing. In addition to Chechnya, which outright declared its independence, you had Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, and other states were really on the verge of doing that. But Yeltsin managed to rein them in. Even, even in, um, you know, Sverdlovsk, where he was from, a Euro's Republic was declared. Mm -hmm. um, a, a sovereign a re a Russian Republic separate from, from Muscovy. So, you know, the, the precedents are there. Uh, but now I think the rupture is going to be far more comprehensive and far deeper, which will give even more opportunities for these units to emerge. Reading your book, it, um, it emerges that Yeltsin kind of, um, uh, he staved off um, a rupture that could have happened then. And there were processes in the works. There were constitutions. There were uh, elected uh, or, uh, bodies. And uh, Yeltsin kind of tricked or or outright lied to to or made false promises that were uh, that allowed the central government to maintain its its vertical mm -hmm. power. Yeah, absolutely. I think both Yeltsin and uh, and Gorbachev uh, were using these sovereignty movements to their advantage against each other. Remember, there was a big struggle for power at the time. Gorbachev wanted to preserve the Soviet Union. Yeltsin wanted to uh, to raise his stature and become head of some new Russian uh, uh, entity, Russian Federation that emerged. And remember Yeltsin's famous phrase, swallow as much sovereignty as you can, which was meant for uh, the, all the federal units within uh, autonomous units and regions within the Russian uh, Soviet Federal Socialist Republic at the time. Uh, but then he reined it back. You're absolutely right. He reined back a lot of those uh, uh, different forms of uh, um, sovereignty that were declared. I mean, there were dozens of units that had declared their sovereignty. Some intended to go further. And of course, a lot of people were looking at Chechnya. Uh, 
uh, if Chechnya was allowed to have gone without this massive Russian military assault, I think other republics would have followed suit, not just in the North Caucasus, but probably in the middle of Volga, South Siberia and elsewhere. Uh, Yeltsin, for Yeltsin and Putin, the crushing of Chechen independence was intended to, to not only prevent Chechnya leaving Russia, the Chechen Republic, but also to prevent other republics, other regions from, from leaving Russia as well. Um, so in, in some respects, we're back, we're going to go back to that situation, but with a new equation, with a much weaker Russia, with a Russia that's losing and I think will lose the war in Ukraine, with a Russia in which power struggles are increasing, in which the economy is collapsing. We haven't really talked about the economic side, but the economy in Russia is going to be a disaster over the coming year. So given all those factors, I think the encouragement for uh, republics and regions to actually break with Russia uh, are, are going to increase. They're going to accelerate. Do you think that the e economics are get, the economy is going to get that bad? I mean, uh, on the it seems that uh, you know China and India are are supplying or you know are, are markets that that Russia is, is still has access to and is dealing with and and somebody might say, well. Uh, you know the, the West aside, and 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 the EU and the US and and the sanctions and all that, but Russia still has uh, China and and India and and the global. Well, it, it, yeah, it, it does up to a point, but both look. China does not want um, to be sanctioned, secondary sanctioned for assisting Russia. Of course, they'll continue a certain level of trade. They buy cheap oil and gas if they need it. Uh, from Russia, but increasingly, I think China views Russia as not a very reliable country. They did think that Putin would end this war pretty quickly with some kind of a victory. And I think they're very disappointed that this is dragged out and dragging and potentially dragging them into it. So there's a certain distance, I think, that China is putting uh, between itself and, and Moscow. India, I think, is simply exploiting um, the situation to its advantage, trying to get cheap energy, um, uh, cheap foodstuffs, you know, whatever else that it is that they trade with Russia. But the, there's no uh, absolute support. In terms of the economy, let's put it this way, Russia is is very much dependent and has been dependent for much of its energy earnings on on Europe. Um, this is where the big bucks come from. Um, and that now is ending, uh, partly because of the war and the sanctions, but partly because I think Europe is finally realizing that being over dependent on Russian energy is self defeating. Um, and it creates uh, problems of corruption, it creates problems of over dependence. And if Russia decides to cut off, it uses energy as a political tool. So once Europe gets through this winter, which I think will be tough, it's not going to be any more dependent on Russian gas and Russian oil, which I think is extremely important for the Russian budget. They won't be able to recover the sort of finance uh, revenues, um, earnings for their budget from India, uh, China and other places that that's not going to happen. Plus, uh, secondly, I would say technology that there's mm. so much dependent on Western technology. Even now we're looking uh, opening up a lot of the, their um, their rocketry and uh, and and other technical um, captures from this war and how much they're dependent on Western technology is astonishing. Um, of course, there has to be a sort of tighter regime of, uh, against any sanctions busting from Western companies. But mm. I think that itself affects their production of everything from cars to tanks to airplanes to, you know, you name it. Most of their fleet, by the way, is grounded, their, their uh, Aeroflot fleet. Plus, the supply chain uh, appears to be breaking down. If they indeed go for a war economy to try and uh, this mobilization process, as we've mentioned earlier, that's going to affect the civilian economy as well. Um, they're not going to be able to borrow finances, um, uh, loans or anything else internationally. They're not going to get the, the, the technical assistance, technical high tech that they got before. So I think if you put all these factors together, you look at projections, of the Russian economy, not only at a macro level, but at, at the local level, I think it's going to get increasingly tough for a lot of Russians to be able to 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 continue the sort of life lifestyles that they had before. 
Um, of course, there's widespread poverty anyway in various parts of Russia where they recruit uh, the poorest people for the military. But if that starts to hit the bigger cities, the, uh, the bigger towns, European Russia, I think then we're going to see uh, even opportunities there, I would say, for more revolts, more turmoil, more unrest. Not just people leaving the country, but people saying, well, we're fed up. We've got nothing left. What, what can we do? Uh, chapter six of Janusz Bogajski's book, uh, Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rapture, talks about the neighborhood impact and uh, there some of the um, grievances uh, that China has vis-a-vis -vis Russia mm -hmm. are uh, outlined something that hasn't been uh, talked about much, but there are there's a history there as well. There's a history there as well. So, Janusz, you write about a broad gamut of scenarios and a variable timeline, which leaves a lot of room when thinking about how and Russia, uh, how and when Russia will go the way of previous empires. Yet, you identify four broad categories uh, or ways that Russia's rupture can take place. There's uh, one limited fracture, two wide-scale fragmentation, three violent separation and four, complete disintegration. And I was uh, hoping to walk through these um, uh, one at a time. What do you mean by by limited fracture? What's what's limited about, uh, what could be limited about a fracture? Well, yeah, let, let me let me say this though, that the those four scenarios aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, one can lead to the other. I think what I was trying to point out is things may start small, um, but but once they gain some momentum and other parts of the country start to uh, realize that the possible um, repercussions of what they can do to break from from Russia, this could actually expand and accelerate from from one through two through three through four. Limited by limited fracture, I mean that some republics. Uh, in particular, may um, calculate that the end of, of Russia, as we know it, is, is, is here, that the state isn't as strong as it was before, that it cannot contain, cannot keep this republic within the federation and simply declare it its independence. And I can imagine that, despite everything that's gone on with Kadyrov, I can imagine that happening at some point with Chechnya, paradoxically. In fact, Kadyrov may decide uh, at some point that, that there's no... It's not worth trying to keep keep in with Moscow when Moscow is engaged in so much trouble. He should just focus on his own republic. That's one possibility. Then, of course, there's others. Tatarstan, uh, which has managed to stay out of this as much as possible, which was very close to declaring its own independence in the past. Uh, this is, a, remember, a republic with the second largest uh, ethnic population in Russia, a uh, number of Tatars uh, is much bigger actually than than all the other minorities, not just in Tatarstan that dispersed throughout uh, uh, throughout the country. So by limited fracture, I mean there are some republics, uh, maybe even some regions, but I think more some of the republics are likely simply to declare independence and say we're not contributing any more uh, to your military campaigns, we're not we're 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 withholding payments for your budget because our republic is suffering under these economic conditions, and we need to feed our people. We need to make sure they have enough. It's a sort of uh, this fracture that I talk about between regions and center. That some of these regional governors, that even those that have been appointed uh, or gone through this filter of appointment by Moscow. Uh, may come to a point like some of the old communists did. I remember Kravchuk in Ukraine, who was uh, an old-time apparatchik, suddenly saw the writing in the wall and said, no, I'm going to go for independence. I can imagine that scenario could be played out in, in, in some of these republics. So that would be my that first scenario I talk about, this limited fracture. Fragmentation, I would say, once that begins to take off. In other words, once you have a critical mass that decide to leave the country or, or separate and declare their, their sovereignty and even independence, then I think uh, the state itself, the state structure be, be, really begins to fracture. You know, they may be able to <laughs> even swallow uh, or come to terms with Chechnya leaving or Ingushetia leaving or Dagestan. But once other republics follow suit, you know, start to imitate and say, we too can do it, then I think you have the beginning of this, this fragmentation. 
Third point, when, when, when I talk about uh, violent conflicts, I, we mentioned this before, the sort of Serbian Milosevic scenario, or what was partially tried, remember Gorbachev did try to keep the country together, the Soviet Union together, through violence in places. If you remember in, in, in Azerbaijan, in, in Vilnius, in, in Riga, and several other places, um, he did try to uh, to uh, impose a level of violence that would terrorize people not to leave, to, to stay in the country. Here, what I would uh, what I talk about is the possibility that Moscow may try to play its last card, which is the ethno-Russian nationalist card, which they've tried to avoid. If you notice how they've played with this Eurasianism and multi-ethnicity and and uh, you know imperial uh, um you know strong state the imperial state once they start to play the ethno-russian card then i think the country really gets into potential violent um conflicts because um it would spark uh, anti-russian movements amongst many of these ethnicities and remember and i chronicle this in my book in some i think it was in, in 14 of those 22 or 21 i don't include crimea uh ethnic republics um the russians are now outnumbered um there is they're becoming a very small part of the population even in places where they where they had majorities uh, when the soviet union collapsed like uh, like saka um and other parts of southern siberia they are now either in a minority or the um, um, indigenous nation has a plurality, which which means that, and I think more and more Russians are going to leave these territories um, as ethnic conflicts increase. Um, Tuva, for instance, which as it happens is Shoigu is the defense minister's republic, uh, but it has a very small Russian population now and anti-Russian feelings have been mounting over the years. Um, you look at places like um, uh, Ingushetia, the Russian population now, I think, is under 6%. And we haven't even seen the most recent census where Russians have been leaving disproportionately the uh, Siberian um, Far Eastern uh, regions, the only places, uh, ethnically indigenous places, that they're still largely present is the oil producing areas. But even there, I would say, there has been a a change in demography, uh, a change in demographics, people moving in from Central Asia, from the North Caucasus and, and elsewhere. So, so th that leads me to the last point, which is um, a, both a Yugoslav and a Soviet scenario. In other words, both violent conflicts in some places and a more peaceful separation in others. Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is, is going to be the fourth stage before or during the process of the emergence of new states uh, from the Russian Federation. And uh, uh, Tuva, of course, being uh, close to Mongolia and mm -hmm. uh, one of the many um, uh, scenarios that are uh, described in the book are also the um, how the neighbors will react. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about failed state, a guide to Russia's rupture, a book written by Janusz Bugajski just a few weeks before Russia's uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Let's yeah. talk about the neighborhood impact. And okay. Okay. Well, one of the chapters I do devote to the impact that Russia's rupture will have on neighboring countries. And remember, you know, if you look at all the states from Norway and Finland all the way to Japan, and even one could say to the United States that Russia does border Chukotka is only a couple of hundred kilometers away from the tip of Alaska. Uh, um, Canada's not that far away. So Russia borders or near borders dozens of states. And some of these states do have historical claims to territory that was taken by the Tsars um, or by the Soviets. Uh, they remember, the Soviets took Tuva. Tuva was... Uh, basically an independent country even up to the end of World War II before it was taken over by the Soviet Union, uh, much like Mongolia. So um, there are many countries around Russia's borders that have either historical claims to Russian territory or mm -hmm. would want to help kindred people, uh, whether Mongol or Turkic or, 
or Tungus or others uh, to actually separate from Russia and create uh, sovereign independent states. So that's going to be, a, a, a let's say, a process that will also unfold that the West, I think, is not uh, fully, far from fully, not, not even thinking about, I, unfortunately, at this point. I wrote an article actually a couple of days ago on the uh, expansion of the Turkic world. This is another area, in, uh, particularly in uh, southern Russia, where Turkey, I think, uh, is going to become more of a uh, significant regional player, not only vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia, uh, Azerbaijan and other Turkic-speaking uh, countries, but also amongst Turkic-speaking and um, Muslim-majority nations within Russia itself. You know, Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, North Caucasus republics, they look towards Turkey as a potential, not just a tourist destination, but a sort of cultural link, a linguistic link, an economic link. Uh, in the case of um, Azerbaijan, I was, of course, uh, also a security link. Uh, and I think we're going to see more and more of that with, with, uh, with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, who fear too much Chinese control, so they want to turn more towards Turkey. So you're going to have a, a whole vacuum that Russia is going to create through its rupture that other countries are going to step into. Uh, Turkey, I think we need to work very closely with Ankara. Whatever we think of the political system, whatever we think of, of Erdogan himself, um, it, it, this, you know, this is the most important NATO member uh, in this part of the world, in Eurasia. Uh, we have to benefit from that linkage, that, that membership that Turkey has within NATO to try and uh, pr project security into these states that are emerging from Russia. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's something, again, that, that we need to focus much more on. We're already seeing beginnings of this in the withdrawal of Russia from Armenia, as a major force uh, and with the US now increasingly stepping in and resolving the Azeri-Armenian conflict, I think that can be expanded beyond. What happens, for instance, when Georgia starts to reclaim Abkhazia and South Ossetia? Uh, what happens if North Ossetia declares its independence? Which way it's going to move? There's many of these unresolved questions that are, that are basically going to start to simmer and I think are already simmering in many cases. And then you look at other parts. You look at uh, Ukraine. I mean, once Ukraine, which I think it will, liberates its territory, there may be neighboring regions of Russia that will increasingly look towards Ukraine as a gateway towards Europe. You know, we cannot, <laughs> we cannot discount the possibility that there are Ukrainian populations that have been subdued and Russified uh, within Russia itself that may actually rediscover their Ukrainian roots, their Ukrainian heritage, and start to be proud again of their Ukrainian history uh, and look towards Ukraine as a, as a consolidated state that actually beat the Russian Empire. So one cannot discount the possibility of some of these neighboring regions of Ukraine uh, moving closer um, to, to Ukraine itself, you know, in, in the Kuban area, in uh, Belgrad, you know, there's, there's, there's many places there along the border. And then if you look further north, the whole Finno-Ugric question is going to come to the forefront as well. There are many Finno-Ugric nations in Russia um, that uh, have either been uh, repressed or their organizations have been exiled. And they look towards Estonia and Finland uh, as uh, kindred countries. And now that Finland, interestingly enough, is entering NATO, I think it's going to be much more of a player in this region as well. And the Finns, if anybody, have direct experience of, of war with Russia and defeating Russia. Um, so I think Finland uh, and this whole Finno-Ugric question amongst the, the Mari El, the, um, the, the populations in Mord Mordvinia, the, the, the Komi, I mean, many, many other peoples in Russia are going to be looking towards uh, their own heritage, their own indigenous um, self-determination. So, you know, and I'm, not, I'm not even talking at this point about China's potential claims uh, mm -hmm. to parts of Siberia. Japan's claims to particularly the northern Kuril's islands that they've never accepted as Russian territory, 
uh, but were, you know, these islands were forcibly taken at the end of World War II by Stalin, and there's never been any treaty signed. Even Sakhalin, remember, a large part of Sakhalin used to belong to Japan. And a lot of these countries that, that will be emerging, I would say, in the eastern part of Russia are going to be looking towards very rich countries like Japan, like Korea, South Korea, like Taiwan, uh, like the United States, like Canada. Uh, for closer ties. So, again, I think it's incumbent on every Western and Pacific and Atlanticist country, maybe to create some sort of uh, some sort of format, some sort of forum, some sort of uh, some sort of body that that looks at how we are we going to manage Russia's rupture. How can we benefit from this? How can we make sure this process is, is as peaceful as possible, that it leads to new relationships with new countries that have no claims, imperial claims on their neighbors? And this is going to be a challenge, I think. In some places, it could even be conflictive. If you look at China, China may have ambitions that go well beyond what we would want it to have in central, um, in central and eastern Siberia. So, you know, there's a lot of work ahead, and I, I outline a lot of this in one of the penultimate chapters of my book to bring attention to the fact that this will have major international repercussions. And that would be chapter six, Neighborhood Impact, in Janusz Bogaisky's book, Phil State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, available now in print and for download from the Jamestown Foundation, a book that I've actually read. And one of the, um, you, you had mentioned it earlier in, in your last response, but I found uh, interesting that in Chukotka, English was actually a lingua franca uh, and the language of commerce uh, before it was um, uh, incorporated and absorbed into, into the Russian Empire. So there's... Uh, exactly. You know, Russians have claims to, to Alaska. I, I think there's better claims of uh, sort of Alaskan Chukotkan uh, <laughs> union of some kind within within some United States and North American Commonwealth. And there are other territories in, in you know, in, in the Far East and the North, which for years there were traders, whalers, fishermen, you know, other uh, both Canadian and American trawlers and others that had very close contacts with the indigenous people. And, uh, you know, those can be restored. Why should these countries be left on this poor periphery, which which is where Russia has left them, where they're potentially quite rich territories? You look at Saka, you know, this is a diamond gold rich country, which has been squashed by Moscow. And now, you know, if the northern, uh, with global warming, as the northern sea route begins to develop, these countries will have coastlines. And, and if not clear of ice all year round, at least capable of transportation all year round. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and um, um, I'm, I'm uh, speaking with Janusz Bogaisky about his book, Fail State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture. I'm coming to you from uh, Canada where uh, we are very well uh, aware and uh, cognizant of our um, indigenous brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. and um, But we also have um, a nation that we refer to as the Métis Nation. And I couldn't help but think about them when I was reading uh, your book. And uh, you talk about these Russian identities. We, we kind of, there's a, uh, uh, a tendency to think of the Russian ethnos as 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 uh, singular and uh, and um, and homogenous, but you make a point that there's uh, there's kind of Russian Métis, uh, there's mm -hmm. the Sibiriaks, right? You... Exactly the the Pomors, you know, the, in northern um, White Sea area, the you know by the Sea Pomor area of of northern Russia, you have the Siberiaks, you know, the people, as I mentioned earlier, who either migrated to or were deported to Siberia um, many years ago uh, because they resisted Moscow. You know, so there is there is a tradition of sort of independence uh, in their in their family histories. Far Easterners also in, you know, Khabarovsk and Vladivostok, much more sort of independence minded people, as we've seen in demonstrations in recent years against uh, uh, imprisoning a governor that they actually respected. 
Um, and other parts of right, you know, the Cossacks themselves, which the Russians have claimed or Moscow has claimed as some sort of Russian population. Well, in fact, as you know, Cossacks were originally a sort of multi-ethnic uh, peasants who escaped feudalism and established their own independent, fiercely independent uh, hetmanates and, uh, and, and villages and military units and so forth. Uh, they were not Russian. Um, if anything, they were really the, one of the Ukrainian states uh, in the 16th, 17th centuries. So again, uh, with Cossacks, and we saw this during the Civil War, the first population actually that Lenin and the Bolsheviks really massacred were the Cossack population because of their fierce independence and their willingness to fight subordination. So, you know, again, it's another population that the, the Russians have tried to absorb within the Russian ethnos, uh, but with limited success. Uh, and um, the more that the Ukrainians, I think, define themselves and break free of that Russification process, the more I think it's going to encourage others, uh, Cossacks, Pomors, Sibiriks, uh, Far Easterners and others. Um, absolutely. And there's another fact here, which I think is interesting. Um, Many of the, the Russian um, populations in Siberia, Far East, Far North, uh, married local um, into local communities, uh, adopted a lot of the indigenous cultural, linguistic and other uh, cultural traits. Um, they're not necessarily going to be pro-Moscow when it comes to the crunch. We cannot... You know, we cannot assume that Russians, uh, ethno-Russians or those that descended from ethnic Russians are going to be loyal to Moscow. Far from it. They are be probably more loyal to their local families, to their local communities when they move towards independence. And remember how many uh, even ethnic Russians supported independence in many of the countries that broke from the Soviet Union. So I think we'll have the same process uh, visible now. Uh, as uh, republics and regions break away from the Russian Federation. And the Cossacks, of course, um, if they don't already know, should be reminded that they are mentioned in Ukraine's national anthem. In um, Ukrainian's national anthem is uh, is proud about um, about the Cossack roots and 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 perhaps the Cossacks uh, that um, have not been assimilated will remember that. And Ukrainians are, of course, a uh, uh, significant population in the uh, in the Far East and and in Siberia, and um, uh, they've been suppressed. They've been uh, the uh, Ukrainian identity has been um, has been targeted by by Russia. But uh, perhaps this war will will awaken will awaken uh, some of them to rediscover their their Ukrainian roots. And like you say. Um, um, well, you didn't mention the phrase, but it came to mind, the born-again Ukrainians that, mm -hmm. that uh, might emerge. So uh, your monograph is dedicated to the citizens of the Russian Federation whose time of liberation is on the horizon. And a special tribute to those brave peace people arrested for reading this guide on charges of, uh, quote, violating the territorial integrity of the Russian Federation, just for reading... Yeah. Uh, your book yeah uh, what what's happened how did that go down how are well well let's put it this way i said those that the, those that will read it and and uh, are caught reading it will probably be arrested for uh subverting or undermining the territorial integrity of the uh, russian federation they've introduced in moscow all sorts of laws to prevent people even talking about russia's russia's potential disintegration they've even now fining people the last i heard for uh posting maps uh where russia's borders are not what the state says they are in other words, if I was to post a, a futuristic map of the different republics that would break away from Russia, I would not only be fined, I'd probably be arrested for that. So there are so it's, it's almost like a paranoid um, reaction to uh, what is on the horizon. And if you listen to some of the speeches, there was one occasion I mentioned in my book where Putin was confronted by, I think it was a television host who said, look, why don't we just allow the North Caucasus to go free, to break free? Wouldn't that help resolve Russia's problems? Which is something actually Navalny at some point was talking about, if you remember during demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And Putin said, are you crazy? Uh, 
you know, I think you said there are something like 2,000 conflicts in this country that could create another Yugoslavia. So they are afraid, they are paranoid about people talking about it, because once you start to talk about it, you think about it and you can act upon it. Um, and this is, I think, the big fear. You know, it, the truth always brings down dictatorships, always brings down empires. However much they try and hide it, however much they try and suppress it, but it's what they fear the most because it, the people will act upon that in order, in order to become uh, free people, in order to become liberated, and in order to basically to restore some sort of semblance of normality in their lives. You know, this state has now become abnormal. It's a state at war with the West. It's a state that's being crushed economically. It's a state that increasingly expects everybody to die for the Kremlin. And, you know, this cannot continue. Um, so, again, my book is also, I would say, for what I see is when I say Russian citizens, not just Russians, but all people that live in this Russian empire, this Russian federation, who I don't... I don't see as uh, in a derogatory terms like some people do as as, sh as sheep as simply following the leader. They need to be encouraged. They need to be encouraged to overthrow this system and to create their own states. Um, so this is what I'm trying to do as well with the book. I'm not only looking at the future, but encouraging the future to happen. Thank you very much. We've been talking to Janusz Bogajski, author of Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, available now in print and for download at the Jamestown Foundation website. Links below this video. This has been Steph Kobandera and Janusz Bogajski speaking for ARC TV. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefko. My pleasure. All the best. All the best.